Good morning, everyone. Now, I'm going to have to let you in on a little secret. I This video was meant to come out yesterday, and I recorded it yesterday evening only to discover that the audio was entirely corrupted. So, a little heartbroken, here I am this morning re-recording it. Now, you may be wondering, why am I playing Mermaid Symphony, a game that uh, I gave a video for uh, a while back now? Um, well... It's because I have some very exciting news to share. That is my phone. Yes, as you've already guessed reading the title of this video, I've made Mermaid Symphony into a multiplayer game. I was really inspired by the response to my last video on multiplayer games, and I took it on myself to take it a step further to see if I could translate what I sort of had worked out in theory and make it work in practice. And I'm really excited uh, to show all of this. Um, just for a little demonstration of like, um, what else is going on here? If I open up a new tab, and let me just pull it over to the other side of the screen so we can see them both at once. So what you'll see is there is a, uh, a new game on itch. This is completely up. This is uh, open to the public. And there is no trickery here. Like, this is not a server running on my computer. This is not, um, you know, the, this is something that can be used right now. You can see create room, join room, where if you type it in, you can type the four letters, four letter code in the left corner or you can click join random room to find a random room that has people in it and you'll see it all joins up. As always, you'll find um, links in the description of this video to GitHub where you can download the files. Unfortunately, if you remember Mermaid Symphony from before, um, these files are paid assets, or the art, I should say, is paid assets. And unfortunately, part of the license on the art is that I'm not allowed to share it. So what you'll find in this, uh, in the repo, in the GitHub repo, uh, is all of the game files that you need to open the game to view the commands, to view the events and the actions, but uh, it doesn't have any art. For that I apologize, um, but just honoring and respecting the wishes of the creators. But let's get into the main chunk of this video. We will be getting into um, G develop. We will be taking a pick through it, but I really want to talk to you about what it's like to make a multiplayer game in G develop. And so on this topic, what we're going to cover is, um, why is multiplayer hard or why does it have a reputation for being hard? How do you connect games together? Like what does it make, take to make two phones, laptops, computers talk to each other over the internet? And what needs to be shared when you make a multiplayer game? And I think this is a really interesting one, and I'm guessing that there are going to be bits in there that might surprise you. And finally, we're going to put it all together in GDevelop um, and talk about how, yes, you can make a multiplayer game in, uh, in GDevelop. So firstly, why is multiplayer hard? I don't know if you've ever heard the joke before about the person who believes that the world is uh, flat and then sits on the back of a turtle. And when asked, well, what's underneath the turtle? They go, well, you know, you can't trick me. It's turtles all the way down. In some way, that's what a bit like making a multiplayer game it feels like. Every time you do one level, oh, there's just something else you need to do. And at times it feels like you're developing two games at the same time. Because not only are you thinking about the game as it's played to the player, like the thing that's physically shown on their screen, but you're also having to deal with all the issues that come um, just from sending, having data come to you late. So whether that's other players, whether that's other actions, and sometimes it does feel like you're trying to solve, uh, make two games at the same time. If you go online, there are a lot of resources on ideas and tips and tricks and suggestions and strategies. And one of the problems is many of them work. Like, many of them work really well. Um, and in fact, 
because they all seem to work so well, how do you pick which one's right for you? And this is this leads me on to my next point. Whilst there are many ways to work, there are even more ways that don't. And the reason for this is not because the techniques or strategies or ideas themselves are wrong, but because multiplayer actually is an experience fine-tuned for each individual game. And you'll see me repeat this many times throughout this presentation, that what I'm saying worked for, multi for Mermaid Symphony multiplayer might not work for your game, um, and vice versa, because the needs and the needs of each game rely on different techniques. Mm, apologies. <coughs> and it really is a constant state of experimentation and refining. And you need to have that the entire way through your game in order to make sure um, you're giving the right experience. And I'm still having this. I should point out, Mermaid Symphony is rough around so many edges, it's practically a sphere. It's, it's really not polished, but it is in production. And even now I look at it and go, oh, I could add this feature, or this could be tweaked. Everything is about experimentation and multiplayer games are hard because you need to keep refining and tweaking to get it right. And if you don't get it right, and I'm sure everyone has had some kind of bad experience before, it's just not great to say the, to put it lightly. So with that out of the way, let's talk about how you can connect multiplayer games together, or connect games together. In general, there are two ways, just as a broad overview. You have dedicated server, which we're going to call authoritative, and peer-to-peer, -peer, collaborative. So in an authoritative model, all the players send their messages to a server in the middle. And a server is just a, you know, I suppose a fancy way of saying a computer on the internet. And so all the players send their information to the server in the middle, and the server is actually the one playing the game. So all the players will say, I am taking, a, I'm being like told to step forward, I'm being told to step back, I'm being told to shoot, I'm being told to jump. The server listens to all of this, it plays the game, and then it sends back to all the players, and this is what the game looks like right now. So what's good about this is it's high performance. You can attach, servers can handle many, many connections. They can, um, if you have games with lots of uh, other players all at once, take Battle Royale modes, take um, big, uh, I was going to say Battlefield modes, yeah. Like they handle many, multiple players really well. Um, it's also private, or at least there's privacy. You only connect to the server. You don't know who else you're connecting to. And it's good against cheating, because in dedicated authoritative models, the games just send the commands to the server. It's not like you can fake it by sending the wrong commands. The server listens to all the input, and it does what it wants to do. You can't just teleport your player across the map because you say, aha, my position is now over there. The dedicated servers won't allow that. What's bad about it is that it costs money. It's expensive, um, especially once you scale up into into big, uh, oh, sorry, high number of players, um, it's really expensive to have all of those, all that set up. And on top of all the cost of the servers, it, take, it takes time to set up and maintain. I only, for Mermaid Symphony multiplayer, there's exactly one server running. And it took me a day just sitting down, following very well written instruction guides, but trying to understand the process of what I needed to do in order to get the server, give it a certificate, set it up uh, for web sockets, etc., etc. So not only does it cost time, not only does it cost money, but also it can also be complex to implement. Now this depends on how you make the game. Some game engines like Unreal and Unity, their server model is a little more like running the game itself on the game engine, um, and so. In some ways, the game, to, the engine developers have made it easy for you um, to build your game in a game engine and then like run it on a server. However, GDevelop runs in uh, JavaScripts or HTML's Canvas. It doesn't really have that open to it, and so if you wanted to make an authoritative server in GDevelop, it would take you time because you would basically be building the game twice: once in GDevelop and then once in code on the server. And you can imagine how costly that is to work with and to iterate on. And finally, the last problem with dedicated servers is that 
well, you can't really run without them. I'm sure you've heard recently of like um, Battlefront or some other games like that just have their servers turned off, etc. And then the game stops. And that's it. It doesn't matter how many people were enjoying it. It doesn't matter how many people were playing it. The company decided it wasn't making them any more money or they were, you know, it's reached the end of its life. So we're turning it off and the game ends. And unless the community is motivated enough and manages to get hold of some of the servers and server code and run it themselves, otherwise, if that doesn't happen, the game just finishes. But let's talk about collaborative. So in peer-to-peer -peer games, rather than each player connecting to a server, each player connects to every other player. And rather than a central server simulating the game and telling all the players, and this is what's happening, each player's computer is responsible for working out what the game should show. So if one player moves, they send the message to all the players saying, I've moved in this direction, I'm here. And then all the players, their computers simulate that by moving that person's character to the position set. So what's good about this is it's free. Like you don't need to, as a game developer, you don't need to pay for anything. Your players have computers, your players pay for their own internet. They send messages to other players. It's great. Um, the no host advantage thing is uh, a bit of, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's a bit of a, a copy error. It was actually from when I had another slide talking about um, servers hosted locally on, uh, servers hosted locally on a player's computer. So you can ignore that because I've merged that slide. Um, also, this method does have the lowest lag, um, which is especially important for some games like fighting games, where if it's like, you know, if it's one on one and you rely on like frame level decisions to like block, grab, counter, combo, um, having the lowest lag is really important. It's also quite fast to implement. Um, caveat. Not every game is going to be fast to implement like this, but the advantage of not having to talk to a dedicated server means that you basically build one game. You have your game with all the actions, and then when you receive a message saying that another player has done those actions, you just need to play that out. Um, so in some ways, it's faster to develop with. What's bad about it is that as the number of players increases, the number of connections each computer has to have increases, and this starts to put a strain on everything. So if one of the players has poor internet connection, suddenly all the players are suffering um, because of it. If uh, one of the players is situated far away, they have a really poor experience because their messages physically take further, uh, take more time to reach, um, to reach all the other players. There's also no privacy because you have to connect to everyone else's computer. Um, they know your IP addresses and if someone uh, has bad intentions and wants to try and DDoS you or something like that, they have your IP. There's also a high risk of cheating. Um, it's much harder without an authoritative server to prevent a player from faking messages, to say, from saying, oh yeah, I am telling you that I've just teleported a thousand meters away, and every other person's computer going, okay, we'll just have to keep up with it. I gotta be honest, Mermaid Symphony multiplayer doesn't have that kind of protection. If you want to go, if you want to go, quote unquote, hack it, and send random messages to make your player fly across the screen, or I don't know, become invincible, you could probably do that. Um, and it's quite hard to do. And I, it was one of those things I didn't put the effort in because I was trying to explore uh, other things. And just because there's no server in it, it doesn't mean that its setup can't be complex. Um, I've a lot of the comments I received from the last video asked for. Uh, peer-to-peer -peer or like, you know, local connections, two devices on the same Wi-Fi connecting to each other. Um, and I got the impression that many people thought that, well, since there isn't a server, it's better, like it's freer, it's cheaper, it's great. Actually, often it still requires servers in order to make the initial connection um, to each other, or otherwise you have like complex port forwarding setup, etc. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer has advantages, but it's not, well, it's not perfect. And um, it's definitely not simpler to set up. So with all of that said, what do I pick? I should caveat by saying that what I was going for um, was very specific. And I will get on to exactly what I wanted, which is why I am announcing that 
the way the multi moment symphony multiplayer is set up is I picked both. Let me get into why. I wanted to be I wanted to optimize for development and player experience. I wanted to be able to, as a sort of a mantra for GDevelop, I wanted to be able to move quickly and make something. But I didn't want to compromise on players having bad experiences. And so let me get into what the setup is. What we have is a server in the middle called a relay server, which all players connect to. And uh, what happens is rather than this server telling all the other players what the state of the world is, when it receives a message from one player, it sends it to all the other players in the room. And the game is divided up into rooms, and it can have as many rooms as, as can possibly fit into it. And there's no limit on the number of players you can have in a room. And this is how it's optimized. So by having a dedicated server, it is a high performance connection. Each player connects to it. Um, I believe they're going to have a great experience. You know, you don't, you're not relying on other players having um, good connections or living close to it. Um, and it can handle many, many players. As I said, you could ha possibly have 20 plus people in a room and the game should still run great. But it also has some of the um, benefits of peer-to-peer. -peer. Because the server doesn't run any logic, what's happening is each player is sending a command to all the other players, and then their games execute that. Which means that it, gets, it allows you to simplify what you're making. It's, it, I know I said before, making multiplayer feels like two games, but in at least making the logic work, it's like developing one game. The downsides is it's not free. I am paying for the server. I'm not paying too much, and it's fine, um, but it is not free. It's also vulnerable to cheating, and I mentioned this before, and uh, it can become desynced if the player master uh, is having issues. Uh, just to explain what the player master is, in each room, one of the players is given the hidden title of master, um, and all this means is there are some actions in the game which I only intended to be executed once, such as uh, spawning treasures randomly or spawning obstacles randomly. And it was just helpful to give someone the title of master and say your computer is the one responsible, your game is the one responsible for spawning those. And if that master leaves a new one's picked and that's it, that's fine. That's So th this is my part authoritative, well part dedicated server and part peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connection setup is. So let's talk about, we've talked about the setup of a multiplayer game. Let's talk about what needs to be shared. Have a look at this image for just a few seconds and try to point out, guess, count what is and isn't being shared. And, well, three, two, one. I'm glad you had that time. Were you pointing out all of it? I should add that red means we are sharing, and blue means we are not sharing. So you must be asking, Joshua, why are the same thing in red and blue? There is both a mermaid in red and a mermaid in blue, and a falling thing in red and a falling thing in blue, and a falling thing in red and blue. What's going on there? Let's get into it. In a multiplayer game, you are aiming to share as little as possible. You are also aiming to optimize things that you change frequently. You also are hoping to take care of things that happen once or regularly, and you're also very interested in randomness. I come to think that multiplayer is around the lines of this mantra. What is the least that needs to be shared for a player to have a great experience? And this really is a question that's unique to each and every game. And it comes from the very basic idea that the more that you need to share, the more problems that can occur. Whereas the less you need to share, the simpler things become and the better your experience is. But there is a balance, there's a trade-off. And it comes from actively looking at your game that you want to make multiplayer and asking some tough questions. Like, well, if this player isn't moving, do I need to update anything? Do I need to send anything? Also, um, does it matter what frame of the animation the player or this object is in? Like, 
how important is it that, you know, the exact animation of their tails flapping is synchronized? Or it, actually, is it okay that I just say, oh yeah, I'm playing this animation, and I let it play differently on every person's game? And, you know, are there numbers that are important to sync to other players, or actually do you not need to share it? And then most interestingly, how precisely does everything need to be linked up, synced up? So you can see from the falling obstacles and treasures, do they need to be like precisely linked up on every person's game? Or actually, is it a good enough experience if every player sees them in roughly the same position and whether you hit them or don't hit them makes sense to your game and your game alone? These are, I, I, I just say, these are like, these are open-ended questions. They are questions of game experience, they're coins, questions of design, and they're questions each and every game must ask itself. But now that we've decided what we want to share, um, let's talk about things that change frequently. Um, in Moment Symphony Multiplayer, that's movement. So player movement is updated once every frame. So the principle behind things that change frequently is A, send it as infrequently as possible, and B, send it to as few people as possible. What do I mean by this? So, as I said, Mermaid Symphony Multiplayer, players, when they're moving, update every frame. And this is inefficient. And future work, if I was to do it on this, would say, well, what happens if I send it instead of every frame, but if I send it every tenth of a second? What if I send four frames a second? You know, what if I send six frames a second? Can I get away with sending less? and just faking it on the client side. So smoothly moving the player between the old points, even if they don't line up frame by frame, can I get a good experience? Because the less I send, the more I'll preserve people's internet, the better experience everyone will have. And finally, you can see in this model that the player at the top is sending a message to the server, the relay server, and that relay server is sending it to every other player other than itself. And it doesn't need to send it back to itself because, well, it already knows the movement, it's updated it. And just to demonstrate what this looks like, in code, you can see that in the case of movement, broadcast it to everyone else in a room. Whereas the default is broadcast it to the entire room. So this is me demonstrating how, like, for things that change regularly, I want to use as little of people's internet connection as possible, so send it to as few people as possible, which means not the player that sent it. But for the things that happen once or rarely, single events, create an object, delete an object, well, what currently happens is we send it to a server and the server sends it to everyone at the same time. And this works out pretty well because it are, they are things that happen infrequently. And so you can't get away with just, or it's easiest not to try and do anything clever, just send it to one and send it to all. And as you can see, um, just to reiterate, like in the case of movement, you broadcast it to others, not the person who sent the message. Where in the case of default, if you're not, if it's not movement or joining a room, you're broadcasting it to the entire room. But finally, let's talk about randomness. The way random, like in Moment Symphony multiplayer, um, a couple of things are done randomly. So when an uh, when a treasure or an obstacle is spawned, we randomly pick which of the animations, uh, which of the art we want to use for it, do we want it to be a pearl, a crown, and then we decide how fast we want it to fall. We've got a min speed, we've got a max speed, we pick a random speed in between that. But by default, randomness is random. Two computers, if you ask them to pick a random number, should not pick the same random number. But it's useful for us to have randoms that is predictable, or the fancy word for predictable, deterministic. If we didn't use predictable randomness, whenever we created an object, we would have to send all of the data with it. We would have to code in and say, create this object at this position. Oh, and it can have a random speed. This is the speed it should be. In random frame of animation, this is the frame of animation. And you can see that where normally we would use randomness just to add diversity, free diversity into the game, suddenly we use it, randomness turns against us and makes us do more work in order to get the details that we want. Details that we wanted just to offload to the random number generator, we now need to actively hard code and specify. Or we can make randomness predictable. 
included in the gdevelop behavior is a script I copied from online. Um, it's all open source. I haven't done anything wrong there. And it is, um, it basically allows two computers, if you give them uh, to come up with the same number, and it does this with a randomness key. And the way this works in gdevelop is, uh, sorry, in Mermaid Symphony Multiplayer, is the master player shares the randomness key to every other player. And every other player says, okay, we've got this and we're using this in our code. And what happens behind the scene is when an object is created, each player call, uh, calls this special random function in order to get a random number. Now these numbers are random-ish, like they're not as predictable as one, two, three, four, but it is guaranteed that they will call the same, they, that when you ask for a random number, they will all give the same number. And so when a treasure or a, an obstacle is formed, every player picks a random number for the uh, frame of the animation and picks a random number in order to find the minimum and max, in order to find the speed it's going to fall. And because they're all using the same randomness key, you can all guarantee, uh, you can guarantee that they're all going to show the same thing. And that's how I managed to get away with sending less data and generating more on the client side, but still having it sync up. Finally, let's put it all together in gdevelop. Um, I will hop into the, the game very briefly and just have a little look around, um, but what we're looking at here is just a couple of slides highlighting the main points. Um, so you can see that in the menu scene and the game scene, you have these two conditions, uh, two actions that say initialize networking. And in the player scene, in the game scene, you also have one that says initialize the player behavior over the network. This is what using the behaviors looks like is to connect up to the server and to spawn a player. When it comes to sending players locations, um, there's two paths. Firstly, we check, and believe me, this could be done way better, uh, Like, and that's talk for the future. But basically, we go through each mermaid and we say, if this is our local player, then update them on other clients. And what this does behind the scenes is it sends the player's position, angle, animation to every other player. But what we're also asking is for every other mermaid that's not our player, update them from other players. So what's happening behind the scenes is that we take our player and we send all of the details to all the other players. And all the other players, when they receive the message, they put it in a queue and they say, this, this mermaid has this uh, animation in it or this movement in a queue. And when it comes to each frame, we take a new position off that queue and we move the player through it. And that's how we achieve the, um, you know, the flowing synchronization, flowing synchronized thing. Um, we are sending messages, storing messages, and replaying them. Creating and deleting items, a bit like creating and deleting players, looks like this. Um, you can see that we're using the master of the room. So we're saying if this is the one chosen player to do this, then create treasure and uh, delete treasure. Oh, if they're if they're in collision with it. And both of these are one-time actions. You send them off to everyone and everyone receives them at the same time. Um, I should add that you see under delete treasure, you are passing in a variable string called remote ID. Behind the scenes, whenever something is created over the network, it's given, a, um, it's given an ID. And so if you want to do something that affects that object over the network, if you pass that ID, you can say, I'm doing this thing to this object every player is going to do it on the same one because everyone has the same ID for it. So saying delete this ID on all clients is basically saying delete this object. And finally, when it comes to predictable or deterministic randomness, um, you can see here that inside of the treasure extension or treasure behavior, um, there are two custom uh, uh, functions I've created. Uh, D random in, in range and D random float in range and D just stands for deterministic and so you hit this is um, these are both in the new multiplayer extension that I've been working on and basically um, this does exactly as I described before it it gets a random int it gets a random float and these are both based off uh, GDevelop's own built-in functions that were there before 
but being deterministic, they're guaranteed to be the same as everyone else's number. Because otherwise, every player would see objects falling in different times, in different ways, of different shapes. It wouldn't be good. So let's hop into uh, GDevelop very briefly um, and just show you what it looks like. There is a little connection icon there in the top, um, and I put that in just to make it clear that um, the player uh, is connected to the server. Apparently it's not working there. I wonder why. Hmm, no idea. Um, whether or not the player is connected to the server. Um, the really only main thing of interest is this new multiplayer me um, behavior. Um, where you can jump in, you can see the code that initializes, that creates, that um, does other things. Inside of the player extension, you also have these three new functions, uh, network initialize, update position, update remote. If you're interested in the code, if you care about it, please feel free to have a look. And then finally, inside of the game, it all looks relatively similar, actually, to what it was before. Um, and this is sort of what I meant when I said it's a bit like developing one game. Like, true, you have to do some things like, say, are you the master of the room? Or true, you have to do other things that say, create obstacle on all clients. But aside from that, it basically feels like a single G developed game. So to sum up, multiplayer is complicated. There's no two ways about it. You are making trade-offs in, you know, by the physical laws of the universe, you are having to like decide how to what trade-offs you need to make in order to connect games together and make them the best experience for your game and your players. In general, send as little as you can, as infrequently as you can, and that won't go as so badly. But the last thing I really want to stress home is that multiplayer is possible in GDevelop. And I say this emphatically, specifically to all the questions I've seen on the forum of people asking, can I do this, is it possible? And even more specifically to all the responses that say, no, you can't. Multiplayer is absolutely possible. And all of this is, and none of this is magic. Like GDevelop basically runs in a browser. Browsers have the capability to connect to servers, to send messages to other things. I really hope this get, has got across that multiplayer is possible in GDevelop. And this is something like that can actively be worked on. So what about the future? I am really excited to work towards a future where multiplayer is not only widely available, but easy in GDevelop. I'm envisioning a future where there are easy to use behaviors and events where um, you can import a behavior you know, you can import the multiplayer behaviors like you would any other one that anyone's contributed. You can add them easily to your objects, you can add them easily to your players, and you can very easily set up rooms and make players match up with each other and spawn items. And there's, there is code behind the scenes. You can't get away from that. But just like GDevelop ab abstracts away a lot of the code from how you make the game, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be possible to create these behaviors that allow you anyone to make a multiplayer game as easily as possible. I also envisage that it should be easy to test your multiplayer games. And if your game, uh, if you want to take your game forward to production, there should be a straightforward and clear path for you to be able to do that. Because a multiplayer game that you can't share, is a little redundant. And finally, as I said before, peer-to-peer -peer networking or local networking is difficult. It's not free, it's, well, it's not free in that it takes time, it takes uh, experience, and it takes setup. But there's also no reason why GDevelop shouldn't be able to do it. So to that end, um, I'm really excited to uh, for the possibility of working on this in the future and getting it to the place where um, you can make a game and you can play it with you know a number of your friends and you don't need to put any money into the networking setup because it's working over the local Wi-Fi. As always, I am motivated by the response I got. The response I got to the last video, even though it's like more than a month ago now, has been astonishing. I've really enjoyed reading all the comments. I've really enjoyed all the uh, listening to all the suggestions and taking on feedback. And honestly, 
Um, this is, it, as I said, it's been like over a month since my last video and I have been working this sometimes more, sometimes less, um, but it's really a, a big motivation to me and I thank everyone very much for that. And I'm really excited for what the future holds and continuing to work on this. So as always, please give me a like, if you want to subscribe, if it's interesting, give a subscribe and most importantly, leave feedback because um, I'm really interested in what you have to say on this. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.